Welcome, you radiant hot spring of caring and making, to Spark Tending Episode 10. Ten days in a row of ten minutes or so of matches, tinder, and instructions for tending to your sparks of self-care, creativity, and wholehearted inspiration in the midst of everything. Today is our last day for now. Today, let's talk about bodies. First, the body of the earth you know, that huge, powerful, complex, ancient being that supports us, that liquid, green, lush garden in space, orbiting rhythmically amongst the moon, the sun, and sister planets floating in the almighty art-making studio of the universe. This earth gave us our bodies. We are in every fiber of our beings of and from and with and the same as earth. Somehow, some of us humans, among the most infant of species, amongst billions here on Earth, have for the time being followed some philosophical and economic directions of our own making that are confused. Among many of the confusions is that we've grown out of step with time as it lives in the cycles of sun and moon and planets and light and dark and seasons. We live in our own time now, speeding faster and faster, while ancient Earth continues to breathe in her own steady pace. We've somehow come to believe a story that says we're separate, different, that Earth in her wholeness and her beauty is nothing but inert matter, a collection of natural resources to be exploited for our production of too many useless things, that even other humans are resources to be exploited and wasted. And it feels kind of inevitable, like as normal as the air we breathe. It's in our social systems, our workplaces, our plans, our purchases, our foods, our clocks and calendars, our feelings, our thoughts. The body of the earth is mistreated by the actions we take in our painful state. We, being part of the body of the earth, suffer too. As we speed up, we overheat, and she does too. I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story now, in our last day here. I'm an artist. There's a thing that happens when you're an artist who's committed to going as far as you can with your art in a society that doesn't value or compensates, compensate artists, especially if the nature of your work is not easily aligned with market forces. You get really good at deciding to create things without proper resources. I got really good at that. I spent months preparing for exhibitions for which I would be paid nothing while not working the jobs that could have created income to sustain me. Or I worked jobs for many, many hours and made art during the time that I could have been sleeping. I took on education debt, sleep debt, money debt, health debt, time debt, relationship debt, I ran on empty far too often, and in many ways, I was supported by my creative vision, by the life-giving force of making, emotionally supported, validated by my creative communities. We shared much. We made culture that lived apart from and in resistance to those market forces that are a part of the culture of separation and exploitation. We played. But the place where it became normal and okay to take on projects without adequate resources, that joined forces with some much less examined older belief in me that as a woman, I should make and do and give and sacrifice without recognition or compensation. To pour for others from a cup which for me was nearing empty. I became habituated to sacrificing my well-being physically, monetarily, to the greater good, even when the greater good was my next art project. This is important for me to say to you, because this is what we're expected to do as mothers, right? Sacrifice ourselves to the greater good of raising our kids. Parents, like artists, like students, like entrepreneurs, share a kind of bravado and the kind of physical stamina that we cultivate in the face of overwork and inadequate resources. We gain a kind of social privilege or status from these more middle-class looking roles, which masks the fact that we 
are being exploited and sometimes simply exploiting ourselves. Over the years, I prided myself on an ability to create things from nothing. I founded a community art center, a web design business, a handmade business, multiple art experiments and projects, countless paintings, without the means to really do so. Much of it was funded by minimum wage jobs, cafe work, university teaching as an adjunct instructor. One year, I made a 2,600 square foot art installation for a museum in six months for no pay with a newborn infant and a teaching job making less than minimum wage in the throes of recovery from a physically traumatic birthing experience. Later, I became an executive director of a small environmental organization, which when I found it was circling the drain with a board that didn't do much fundraising and started to try to turn the place around against the odds. I became a mother with a low income, high risk life. When you're an artist slash woman slash mother slash insert your identity here, you just do it. Last summer, I had a break in the work. Instinctively, I knew that the breaking point had to come. I broke up with academia. I faced the fact that the environmental org couldn't sustain me adequately, nor I it. I started looking for a full-time paid job with benefits. The summer sun began to shine. And then I crashed. Within a month, I was incapacitated, diagnosed with Graves' disease, which was causing my constant pounding heart rate, rapid and dramatic weight loss, total insomnia for weeks, inability to digest food properly, and utter exhaustion combined with the metabolism of a marathon runner during the marathon. I was suddenly at bottom. It took months, but I did begin to recover, a process which has involved untangling multiple related and previously undiagnosed health problems, untangling the emotional, spiritual, and planetary crisis that slowly burned my thyroid gland, that beautiful butterfly that governs the regulation of energy in the body over many years. A kind of crisis I feel that we're all facing to some degree in different manifestations, an out of whack, overburn of energy. For me, this manifestation was the perfect expression of the struggles I've always had, running on empty, overheating, being okay with inadequate nourishment. As I've been healing every day, becomes an opportunity to reclaim a relationship to time and pace that has its source in my body, not in any other force. Of course, there's no way to fully achieve this pure state. We can't escape the cultural and economic context we're in, but neither can we escape the context of our bodies and the earth itself. And she's called me back to her in a poetic and emphatic and tough loving way. The language that I use to connect my body to the earth, to acknowledge the poison of our human relationship to earth and resist it both in the world and in my being is important. I hope you'll find this language useful for you too. Each day before the to-do lists, before doing and building and creating and parenting and working, I take some non-productive time. Time to light some candles, stretch, move, and say some version of this vow. This body, this beautiful body, this beautiful being created by Earth herself is not a natural resource. It is not raw material to be harvested. It's not an energy source that can be extracted or exploited. This body is a no fracking zone. This body is sacred. I am whole here in this place, in this one lovely cell of this most ancient beauty, earth. Today, I listen to my body first and act accordingly. I conduct my work at my body's pace and generously give myself what I need. When I do my work, I tend first to that which will sustain me in my work. When I start to feel like all is urgent and the only solution is to push myself, to drive onward, to lapse into that amnesia, 
that erases this precious place, I am to stop in whatever way I can and resume listening. For the first time, I'm starting to hear myself. Often I forget by noon what I vowed at nine. Some days I have no more than 30 seconds to make this vow. Some days I never act on it. Some days I do it for an hour and I cry the whole time. It's all okay. It's all good. Liberation isn't some perfect place we get to. It's a path and a process of remembering and forgetting, remembering and forgetting and remembering. So mothers, as we wrap up this series of spark tending episodes, I leave you with this question. Is your body a natural resource to be extracted for the greater good? Or is your body a sacred place? Is your mind another way that your body listens and loves and generates language and music and wonder? Or has your mind taken on the language and methods of the extractor, the exploiter, in relation to the rest of your being? Can you resist that? Can you take back the landscape of your being from that marketplace and its speed and efficiency? Even if you work beyond full time, even if you're engaged in the economics of our world at every moment, Can you do this in your mind for 10 minutes a day? Can you celebrate and wonder at every moment that you remember to treat yourself with utter respect and care? What is your daily vow? Thank you so much for joining me in Spark Tending. Mother, you're beautiful, and the spark of your life is a precious one. Be well, dream, Want, act, rest, love, resist. Come talk to us at the Facebook group Tending Sparks. Sign up at amywalsh.net slash spark. Love you.